Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm doing something totally different. Today, I'm going to give you writing tips, which is going to be relevant for you no matter what you're doing. If you're in college, if you're trying to apply for jobs, if you're doing anything like that, because it's super important. One of the ways that I like to, you know, encourage people to care about their writing is by asking them. Imagine for a second if you were texting one of your friends and they were replaced with an AI or they were replaced with another human being. How quickly would you learn that it wasn't your friend anymore messaging you? Probably pretty quickly. And the same applies to you. There are parts of you that are expressed in your writing that make you you and that make people be able to tell who you are. And as we live in a world that relies upon more and more writing, more and more of communicating through text, it's important that you develop a voice within that text to best you know, understand yourself and to project yourself into the world. When you apply for a job, if you don't just use AI, which you shouldn't because it all sounds the same, it's very boring and dry, there's no real identity in it, the first thing your prospective employer is going to see is something you've written in your cover letter or anything. So writing is super important. And I'm gonna give you tips here to help you improve your writing at every level, no matter if you're writing in high school or college or job application or anything like that, because it's part of who you are and your expression. And it can then have an effect on how you actually speak and exist in the world, I hope. Now I'm doing this, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see that I have a PowerPoint primed up. I'm gonna go through it. It's gonna give you lots of good tips here, but if you're just listening to it, I think you're also gonna get a lot of value out of this. I'm gonna read every slide, it's just text. So I think that you're gonna be able to follow along uh, just fine if you're just listening to this, by the way. But if you want the full experience, you know, find it on YouTube where there's the video, but it's not totally necessary or totally required. So just to break it down for you, I'm gonna teach you the fundamentals of writing in English, and then I'm gonna teach you some essay writing tips. This is gonna be more relevant for those people who are writing college essays, but it has its you know, place in so many other uh, domains as well. Now to begin, the most basic fundamental thing, basic fundamental, we'll talk about redundant phrases in a bit. The most basic thing, the lifeblood, the, the beating heart of a sentence in the English language is that it includes a subject, a verb, and an object. Not every sentence has this. Like you can go into, um, you know, go into a subway or a metro or whatever, and there's going to be a sign that says, for more information on blah, 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 that's a sentence that doesn't follow this basic structure. But if you're writing for a job application, if you're writing a letter, if you're writing an essay, you're going to be using the subject verb object form. This is how you write your sentences to be the most clear and precise and direct. So what does that mean, the subject verb and object? Well, the subject verb and object refers to the three different parts, the basic parts of a sentence. The subject is the person or thing performing an action. The action is the verb and the object is the thing which the verb is then acting on. So as you see in the example that I have here, I walked to the beach. This is a perfectly fine, you know, totally acceptable sentence in the English language where I, the subject, am the one performing the action that is walking to the beach. The beach being the object that I am walking toward or that is complementing my verb. Within the English language, if you want to get into the nitty gritty of writing tips, complementing would refer to something else, but just bear with me in, in this regard. Now for a sentence to be active within the English language, you must follow this structure, the subject verb object structure. If you write or say something in a passive voice, it means that you have rearranged this structure. So I have this example here where we have three different subject verb object chunks within the same sentence and it reads as follows. The committee designed the questionnaire, the field workers collected responses, and the statisticians analyzed the results. Each of these cases, it's just one sentence, each divided by a comma, but we'll talk about that later, includes a subject, so you have the committee, then the field workers, then the statisticians, you have 
verbs that they are doing. You have designing, collecting, analyzing, and then finally, the objects that they are working on, the questionnaire, the responses, and the results. In this case, you have a perfectly acceptable sentence in the English language, a perfectly acceptable active sentence in the English language. If we were to transform this into a passive sentence, all we would need to do is replace the object with the subject, just switch their place. So instead of saying the committee designed the questionnaire, you'd say something like, the questionnaire was designed by the committee. So the th people, in this case, doing the action, that is the committee, is now at the back of the sentence or at the at, comes after the thing that they're working on. And I'm going to show you some tips later of how to easily identify these passive sentences that I think is going to be the most valuable thing I teach you in just a few slides. But for now, it's important to understand that this is what constitutes a passive sentence. There's also the inclusion of extra verbs, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more and what, what to watch out for. But at its, at its core, it's just important to acknowledge that the subject is something that is performing an action. It is not necessarily a person. As the example at the bottom here illustrates, uh, a, a subject can be anything. It can be any kind of noun. I'm taking this passage from Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish when he says that the prison separates the prisoner from society. The subject here is the prison because it is the one performing the action, the action being separating the prisoner from society. Now this can also be reduced to the subject and the predicate. So as of now, I've been talking about it as subject, verb, and object. That can also be reduced to instead or described as the subject and then the verb and the object comprise what is called the predicate, the totality of stuff that the subject is acting upon. Now, if we were to change this sentence I just gave and made it passive, instead of it being the prison separates uh, the prisoner from society, it might become to make it a bad passive sentence the prisoner is separated from society by the prison. So the action here is still committed by the prison, but the prison is now at the end of the sentence. It comes after the action and the object that it is acting upon. So there are some things that you can just generally try to avoid. And one of the ways to think about this is the distinction between a priori statements and a posteriori statements. A priori statements are statements in which the predicate and the subject are always implied together. Or the subject always implies the predicate, I should say. Now, in this case, we someone might say the black crow. But we know that every crow is black. So that means that it's not actually really important or necessary at all to say something like the black crow because the color black is implied in the term crow already. It is an a priori statement. It is a universally true statement, just like two plus two equals four, or a triangle has three shape, three sides. You don't need to say that. So when you're writing, be mindful that the things that you are saying are of substance. You are not just repeating something that is a truism. It's not just totally obvious. So some things to avoid, some examples would be like violent war. Of course, war implies violence. Or past history. Of course, history implies the past. Fast cheetah. Of course, cheetah implies speed. To avoid like final conclusion, which is, of course, conclusion implies it being final. Now, by contrast, in contrast, we have a posteriori statements that are statements that are making observations about things in the world that are not universally true. So for example, that crow is on the table. In this case, if you were looking at this video now, you'll see that I've color-coded it where crow is the subject that is acting upon the table, is on, literally, the table. And in this case, I haven't said the black crow is on the table, that's implied in the term crow. What I am saying instead is something that is not universally true. If I was on the phone with someone and I said, that crow is on the table, they'd probably be like, what? There's a crow on the table. Or they wouldn't care. You know, however they would respond. 
Now, one of the things you may have also heard is the importance of using the present tense. And absolutely, this is extremely important that you write in the present tense. But maybe you haven't been told why that's important. Well, it's important really to lend precision to what you're saying, but also urgency to what you're saying. So instead of saying something like, Marx argued, like as though this is just something of the past, Marx argued that capitalism exploits workers, you could say something instead like Marx argues that capitalism exploits workers. What that does is it brings the idea to the now. It brings it to the present instead of it making it seem as though this is just something in the past. And this is something that we often do to kind of take the sting out of something we want to say. So if you're in a, a romantic relationship or you have a friendship or, or whatever, and you want to bring up something that somebody said in the past, you might say something like, oh, it, it made me feel bad by what you said. You know, it made me as though it was in the past or I felt bad by what you said. And in this case, what we are doing is effectively being like, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't want it to seem like I'm mad at you right now. I was mad at you in the past, but maybe we can unpack it. But even in the fact that you're bringing this up signals that this is still a problem now. It's not as though something that someone said made you feel bad in the past. It makes you still feel bad now. So instead, say something more direct. I feel bad about what you said, not I felt bad about what you said. And this is just one of the ways in which using the uh, passive, uh, the, the past tense just takes us away from the own meaning, our own meaning that we're trying to inscribe in what we are saying. It's a way by which to take responsibility away from what we are saying. Now, here's an example. An example that we can use to show really the precision of using the active voice. In eating the other, bell hooks argue that the other is commodified by the dominant group. We can transform this to say something instead, like in eating the other, bell hooks argues that the other is commodified by the dominant group. So in this case, it lends a kind of more urgency instead of argued like this is something that's just happened in the past. It's not relevant now. It makes it more punchy. You know, it makes it more appealing. But there's a lot more to this specific sentence that we can start to unpack. And this is where I think the most useful tips will start to come in for you. And that is, I'm going to show you some words that I want you to be hyper vigilant of. And those words are by, this, and of. And I'm going to show you what is wrong with each of these words or things that you can use to, or how you can use these words to correct and edit your writing. So I will show you how we can look at a sentence like this bell hooks argued that the other is commodified by the dominant group, how we can use this to change it into an active sentence by focusing on the word by. And this is why. When you see the word by, ask yourself, who or what is performing the action? I was, for example, I was watching the latest movie by the Coen brothers when I noticed that my television made by Samsung began to go dim. In this case, the word by is conveying the idea or communicating to us that an action is being committed by something later in a sentence. So when we see the word by, it's implying that something is being done by something else. And already in that structure, what we are saying is that the object is being worked upon by a subject. So we have a passive sentence. So when we have a sentence like this, I was watching the latest movie by the Coen brothers. What that is doing is just, you know, absolutely confusing the order of the standard English sentence. Instead, we can change it to say, I was watching the latest Coen Brothers movie, not movie by the Coen Brothers, but the Coen Brothers movie. And we can be vigilant about this by just looking at the word by, by finding all those moments we use the word by. And when you encounter that word, ask yourself, ask yourself, can I replace the thing that comes after the word by, often a subject performing an action with the thing that comes before, can I switch them 
and that'll get rid of the word by. It'll allow me to erase the word by, which is what we're looking for here. By getting rid of the word by, we are making the sentence more active. Now the next thing, this. This has to be one of the last, <laughs> one of the most difficult things to get out of the student's imagination, where you're often told that you have to be clear in your writing. You have to be, you're told that you have to be crystal clear in everything that you say, and that often translates into using the word this to start every sentence, as though what we're saying is like, dear reader, we've now finished this, this sentence, but don't worry, we're not going far. I'm going to start the new sentence with the word this, giving you like this bridge by which to connect the last sentence with this one, which is a very seductive thing to do. It, you know, you feel like this is the best way to be clear. But I think that this is actually like a kind of band-aid solution to being clear. And it is actually makes things less clear than it really could be. Because then you rely upon the word this when it's not always obvious what the this is referring to. So when you see the word this, you can write it in your essay and then you, you correct this later. You know, you find all the examples of the word this. And every time you see it starting a sentence, ask yourself this. <laughs> this. Can I get rid of this period and the word this and bring these two sentences together? So this is an example from my PhD comprehensive exam years ago that was very poorly written. And really the irony to all this is that I'm actually an incredibly weak writer. It's only in the last year or so that I really started to take this seriously. But this is from my PhD comprehensive exam, something that I wouldn't dare write today. Charles's mother, unable to articulate her fears of vaccinations, relies upon emotions to guide her response, period. This presents the double bind of marginalized people who refuse to comply to the dominant mode of argumentation. So why am I even having a new sentence if I'm going to start it with the word this? Because that just communicates that I'm just continuing the same point. If that's the case, how about I think about what I'm trying to say and bring these two sentences together to avoid having this period, and then I can have one full-fledged idea. And you're often taught to avoid this because you're taught that you need to have short sentences, which is a good general principle. But if that becomes just the one way by which you communicate clearly, then it stops being clear and starts being very like jagged and not, not, it doesn't flow. It's not, it's not attached, it's not organic. So instead of the sentence saying, relies upon emotions to guide her response, period, this presents the double bind. I could change that to relies upon emotions to guide her response, presenting the double bind of marginalized people who refuse to comply to the dominant mode of argumentation. So when I say the word this, it's often followed by a verb to present in this case. So I can just get rid of the this, get rid of the period and reconjugate the verb present to present and make it, you know, uh, add an ing often uh, to the end of it, and then continue the sentence and just have one sentence here. Now you should still try to make your sentence as clear as possible, reduce the number of words. This example here is bad because I'm just, back then I was a really bad writer, so there are a lot of things I would change about it now to make it clearer. But the word this is one of the, you know, if you can get rid of that in your vocabulary as you start sentences, most of the time, because you'll find that if you go back into your essays or look at your essays, you probably have it everywhere. Every sentence starts with the word this. You have to reduce that number. Reduce it by like 90%. You can still have it sometimes, of course, that's totally fine. But it's just how frequent it is that is, is the issue. So just be mindful of that and take it out, try to correct it to make your writing flow better without these periods and this is all over the place. And that brings us to the word of. Another word that you should control F at the end of your writing your essay to then sift out some of the issues within your writing. So like with the word by, where I told you that you can control F the word by and then just swap the thing that comes after it with the thing before it and then get rid of the word by, you can do the same thing with the word of. So for example, the modern world is so deeply entrenched in ideals of capitalism. We can change that to the modern world is so entrenched in capitalist ideals, not ideals of capitalism. Now, there are cases where it might make more sense to have an of. You know, the Ides of March 
rings better than marches ides or something. There are cases where you want to be more dramatic. There are even cases where you want to use the passive voice to deliberately communicate a kind of passivity, especially in literature. And that's fine. But with essay writing, when you're going for concision and precision, you want to make sure that you're using these words, you're using these structures of sentences like the passive voice deliberately. And it's not just coming out in your writing in a way that you don't have any control over. So at the end of writing your essay, just control F the words by, of, and this, and perform these, these tricks to see if you can make your writing clearer and more precise. And I, I promise that just doing that at the level of writing will improve your writing. To, it'll double its quality. I promise. All over the place, it'll just give it way more of a punch. Now, verbs. This is the next thing. Something that we often like to do, same with adjectives. We rely a lot on adjectives to communicate a point. So you add more adjectives, it makes it seem more developed and refined, when actually it just makes it you know, cluttered. We often do the same things with verbs. So when you write, be cautious of strings of verbs coming before a subject or an object. So for example, one of the functions of patriarchy is to oppress women. So in this sentence, one of the functions of patriarchy is to oppress women. In this sentence, we have the verb function to function, to be, is, and to oppress. These three verbs are totally unnecessary to have all three of them. Instead, we can just clarify the sentence by saying, the patriarchy oppresses women. So now we've, we've reduced the subject verb object so we don't have this pro prolonged uh, separation between the subject and the verb with uh, the subject and the object with a bunch of verbs. You now have a more concise and direct telling of what the subject is doing. In this case, the patriarchy oppresses women, not the function of patriarchy is to oppress women. And this is a common thing. And we often do it like in cases like function, where the function of X is to do Y, or th this operates to create the conditions that will uh, emancipate people from this condition or whatever, where operates and then conditions are just verbs that we're using to get rid or to just you know, add words to our word count, essentially. And it's part of the product of the way that academia is you know, constructed now, where we're just like word count. You have to have 1,500 words in your essay, as though the number of words is at all represent representative of the quality of the words, which I think would be much more important. And we might see this, or I see this really on full display, in like reality TV shows. If you watch reality dating shows, something you might often hear is, people including many verbs within the simple phrase, I love you. They might say something like, I definitely do think that I'm falling in love with you, which is, what? What are you trying to say here? Do you need to have that many verbs? I definitely do think that I'm falling in love with you. Isn't that just a way to take the sting out of what we're saying, to take responsibility away from our own saying this thing and making it purely about verbs? You know, make it more of a saying, I'm loving language right now than I'm loving you. When you use verbs, quality always trumps quantity. And that brings us here to some common homonym mistakes, just for your own reference. Like the distinction between compliment and compliment. Compliment with an I versus compliment with an E. You compliment with an I when you're giving someone a personalized compliment. I love your hair. But with an E, you're saying that something complements something else. Like Marxism complements psychoanalysis. It doesn't, whatever, but that's when we use that distinction. Wary versus weary. W-A-R-Y, wary, says that it means that you're suspicious, you're concerned about something, maybe you don't trust something. Weary, W-E-A-R-Y, refers to being drained. You're weary, you're, you're exhausted. Affect and effect. Affect is the verb to affect something. I've affected you. Something has affected me. An effect is the noun, the effect of an affect. It's an it is. I-T apostrophe S versus I-T-S. It's without an apostrophe is a possessive. 
versus it apostrophe s, where it just translates to it is. Center and center, principle and principle. These are good things to just be wary of, to be mindful of, you know, vigilant about when you write so you don't conflate them. Now, here are some general tips, and part of my you know, head might be covering some of them, so I'll just read it out that, you know, these, these are things that you can, you know, be kind of cautious of. Remain consistent in your tense. Use the present tense, I mean. Be careful with words like this, these, or it, because sometimes we don't know what those are referring to. When you're writing and you use a book title, italicize the book title. If you're using an article title or a chapter title, put it in quotation marks. Punctuation should go into side of quotation marks, not outside of quotation marks, except for semicolons. Use an adverb like savvier instead of more savvy, for example, because it reduces the number of words, makes it more clear and precise. Avoid double verbs like I do love you, or I began to be interested, or in this essay, I will be using. Instead, just say, in this essay, I use simple enough, not I will be using. Comma placement happens before each new subject, verb, object, chunk. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Avoid large generalizations unless you have evidence. For all of human history, for, for the entirety of human history, or everybody is doing, avoid that because it's not true. It's never true. Avoid the terms or the phrase center around. It's either center on or revolve around. You don't you can't center around something that doesn't work. Avoid long quotes unless it's totally necessary. Instead, work quotes into your own words. Quotes are meant to uplift you. You're not meant to just string together long quotes as though you're telling someone else's story when you're writing an essay. You're writing your own essay. Avoid entire sentence quotes. Instead, introduce a quote. Don't just have one sentence be a quote because then it's just dangling in there without any explanation or unpacking. Double quotes for a direct quote, single quotation marks for an ephemeral idea, like quote unquote truth. You know, you're not quoting that from somewhere, but you're saying that it's, you know, you're posing it as like an idea that you're referencing, but it's not from a specific place. If you use double quotes and you're quoting something directly, make sure to cite it. Very important. Quantifiable amounts, which actually I listed at number 19 as well. This is the difference between number and amount. You use an amount when it's an unquantifiable amount. So an amount of love. And you use words like a lot. I have a lot of love for you all. You wouldn't say I have many love for you all. There are many people in the cafeteria is correct, whereas saying there are a lot of people is not correct because the people are actually quantifiable in that space. I have a lot of sand. I don't have many sand. I have many pepper shakers. I don't have, you don't say I have a lot of pepper shakers, even though you'd say I have a lot of pepper. You wouldn't say I have many pepper. When you're writing essays, avoid contractions like IT apostrophe S or don't. Instead, write them out. Avoid starting sentences with the word because, not all the time, but just be mindful, use it deliberately. You can often cut out the term, the fact. If it's a fact, just say it. You don't have to tell us that it's a fact. You, you don't have to prime us or signpost that you're about to say a fact. Control F words like this, by, and of to see if you can change them around. If you write something in another language, like a quote from another language, you have to italicize that quote. Number versus amount, we already mentioned. Avoid shoehorn brackets and sentences to add exposition or your own thoughts. Be generally careful with that. Avoid contractions again. A quote in a quote uses single quotation marks. In this essay, say, I argue, instead of saying, I will argue. It just lends it a little bit more of a punch. And the word seminal. Seminal refers to semen. Uh, so that's just a tip you can take. Uh, with you and maybe it'll make you want to avoid that word because it's incredibly patriarchal. Now punctuation. A complete sentence has a period. Is it concluded with a period? Sentence fragments are sentences where the punctuation mark has been added prematurely or not at all. And you're going to use punctuation most of the time to separate subject predicate trunks from one another. 
So if I go back to this case I mentioned above, where you have the committee designed the questionnaire, comma, the field workers collected responses, comma, the statisticians analyzed the results. We separate these with commas because we have a different subject, verb, object, chunk, you know, three times here. And we separate with them with a comma to clarify how we are uh, reading this, to clarify what we are trying to say. Because if we take out the comma, it suddenly reads very differently. Like a common example is like, it's time to eat, grandma, where if you don't put a comma after it's time to eat, then it's implying that you want to eat grandma, and that's not good. Don't do that. Now, each of these is a clause. A subject predicate chunk or subject verb object chunk is a clause, and these must be separated with some kind of a punctuation. Either it's period, uh, semicolon, comma, dash, whatever. Each of these perform somewhat of a similar function in distinguishing clauses from one another. Now, I want to give you the example of the distinction between semicolons and commas, because this is a tricky one. Semicolons may also be used to separate things in a list. Like if you have a shopping list, you'll probably have a comma after each thing. But it's a little bit more, more confusing. Now, this is from a text uh, from, from someone named Turabian that is really useful. It's like college writing, um, you know, tips for college writing or something along those lines. And I'm taking this quote from this book. You should reproduce all quoted words exactly. Indicate admitted words with an ellipsis. Indicate added or changed words with square brackets. Now you might notice here that there are uh, semicolons separating each of these instructions. In this case, you are often going to use semicolons when you are describing a list in which each of the things stand, can stand in as its own sentence. Instead of each of the elements of the list referring to an initially stated clause, or subject. So hence, for example, we must speak of that initial dispute without assuming a victory or the right to a victory. We must speak of those actions re-examined in history, leaving in abeyance all that may figure as a conclusion, as a refuge in truth, semicolon. We, we shall have to speak of this act of scission, of the distance set, of the void instituted between reason and what is not reason without ever relying upon the fulfillment of what it claims to be. This is a great example of illustrating and depicting both commas and semicolons working together in the same couple of sentences or just one long sentence uh, and how they interact and how they are distinct from one another. The difference between a comma list and a semicolon list is that the semicolon list can be its own thing. Each of the things mentioned and separated can be its own thing, whereas the comma list, each element between each comma, each thing you're mentioning, always refers to the subject or object under consideration. Now, one of the best ways, the most important way, I think you can improve your writing is as you read. But you have to read with, with a critical eye. As you read things, notice how the people you read never start sentences with the word this. It's very rare. Almost never start sentences with the word this. Instead, as you read, be mindful of the way in which the person you're writing starts and ends their sentences. What words do they use to start their sentence? From how did they finish a sentence and then pick up the idea again in the next sentence? And then you can do the same thing with paragraphs. How do they conclude paragraphs and then pick up a new paragraph and then continue on the idea? And as you read, keeping this in mind, and you should also be keeping in mind how they construct their subject, verb, object systems and, and structures. Just be mindful of that. As you read, just think about that and add them into your toolkit of ways to start sentences and end them so that you have a better idea of all the different ways that you can start sentences to keep the flow without relying upon a word like this. And I like this example from Michel Foucault's Madness and Civilization. I find that Foucault is one of the best people to read to improve your writing personally. I think he's a really great writer. At the end of the Middle Ages, comma, leprosy disappeared from the Western world. In the margins of the community, at the gates of cities, there stretched wastelands with which sickness had ceased to haunt but had left sterile and long and uninhabitable. For centuries, these reaches would belong to the non-human. From the 14th to the 17th century, they would wait 
soliciting with strange incantations a new incarnation of disease, another grimace of terror, renewed rites of purification and exclusion. When you read something like this, I mean, you should be immediately caught by its beauty, but when you read something like this, especially as you're starting out and thinking critically about writing, think about how each of his subjects in each of his sentences are delivered and how each predicate then follows it. So at first read and actually think, what is the subject of the sentence? What is the action it's committing? And what thing is that action acting upon? And you do it and you do it and you do it. And eventually it becomes second nature. You just kind of understand it there. You just kind of, you know, are able to observe it all the time. And then as you write, you'll just do it naturally. You'll naturally deliver a kind of, you know, precision, a kind of, you know, active voice just all the time. And then it's from there that you can begin to really express yourself in unique ways and to play with writing instead of playing with writing in ways that are all wrong. You know, as far as imposing rules upon language, which is a whole other conversation worth having in any case. Now I say writing. These are just some tips that I think might be useful for you. And, and everyone writes essays differently. For myself, as I indicate here, I like to write and then edit later. Some people like to uh, edit as they write. Some people like to have a very detailed plan and then kind of populate that plan with more substantive passages and and their own sentences and so on. In any case, what is most important is you, how you edit your work. And you edit your work like with the example I gave of the control F thing, looking for words like of, by, and this, and correcting them, changing them in ways so as to make your writing more clear, more precise. It'll help you so much if you do that. You edit, and you look for all those times that you use, that you find many verbs strung together. It's a great way to improve your writing is to just start to take those verbs out and make it more precise and concise. Take out un unnecessary adjectives, for example. Now essay organization. This is a big topic. If you're writing a college essay, you will need to break away from the five paragraph structure you were likely taught in high school. However, we can still use a similar system and I'll show you that system in a minute. But first I want you to just ignore and forget all the different kinds of essays you may have been told about in the past. Like, narrative essay, expository essay, comparative essay, argumentative essay, and whatever. At its core, an essay is an argument, full stop. You are trying to persuade your reader of something. No matter what that thing is, if you're trying to even do a narrative exposition, you have made a choice in what you are writing about. You've made a choice in the evidence that you are using. You made a choice in how you are delivering that argument. So in that case, you are making arguments all the way along. And at the end of the day, you're trying to convince somebody of something, your reader of something. So keep that in mind in that your point, your goal is to persuade your reader of something. Now I say organization, let's start with the intro paragraph. The key elements of an intro paragraph include the hook, the thesis, justification, methods and theory, and your conclusion. So your hook should capture your reader's attention. Sometimes you don't need a hook, you just put it in if you want. It's often your first sentence in which you say something like, you know, some bombastic claim about what you're saying to kind of draw your reader in. Then you should immediately go to your argument. State exactly what you are arguing. In this essay, I argue or I am doing whatever, which is effectively just another kind of argument. Explain what you're doing. What is the point? Then lay out what evidence you use. Then describe the methods and theory you use and then provide a little sneak peek of your conclusion that really the ultimate point that you are making. So for example, I'm going to give you the thesis that cats are better than dogs. And you can see if you're looking at this, you see a picture of one of my cats on, uh, on a balcony, on a table. Now I might give a hook like, many people say that dogs are the superior animals to cats, but I am going to argue that actually cats are better than dogs. My justification, cats are self-cleaning, cats are quieter, Cats cost less, less. And in order to make this argument, I'm going to use discourse analysis and Marxist theory to conduct my argument. And the essay will demonstrate the inherent value that cats possess over dogs. Now, as for essay structure, this is a perfectly acceptable way to construct your argument. To move away from the five paragraph structure though, 
Don't think of each of your justifications, each of your pieces of evidence as their own paragraph. Instead, break them down in ways that might extend them into two paragraphs. In order to write about how cats cost less, maybe you're going to look at, uh, do a comparison of vet bills between cats and dogs. That might be one paragraph. Another paragraph might be their likelihood of getting sick. I mean, I hope none of your animals ever get sick. Uh, I, I really hope that never happens. But that could be a whole other paragraph. Maybe dogs are happen to be more uh, likely to get certain kinds of diseases that cost more. You know, that could be a whole other thing. Maybe you could write about how dogs are more likely to get in situations that might uh, injure them. I'm, I'm not saying that's true. I'm not, I have no idea. But these can each be their own paragraph. And in that case, you were already breaking away from the five paragraph structure and you were delivering something that's of the quality and length of a standard kind of uh, college essay. And so you can think of it less like a five paragraph structure where each of your arguments, your three arguments, which is a good number to have, each of your three arguments is its own paragraph. Just divide these ones up into their own sub points, each of which is its own paragraph especially if you can have two or three, then you can have within your the body of your essay, six to nine paragraphs, plus an intro and a conclusion that makes for, you know, you already have a seven, six or seven page paper right there. That's a good, good chunk of, you know, space, especially if you have to hit that word count. But yeah, these are just some tips that I thought, you know, might be useful to you. Maybe not. Let me know. I mean, I really love it if we could all contribute here, you know, add comments as to what, you know, things that work for you so everyone can learn from them. Uh, and yeah, that note, I hope you're all well and take care.